From the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center, HEC-TV, Boeing, and the Danforth Center are proud to present Conversations, a discussion about biotechnology in the United States, balancing regulation, research, and scientific discovery. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's conversation series. It's wonderful to see all of you here tonight. Um, my name is Robin Frankel. I am chair of the Friends Committee, and the Friends Committee presents the conversation series, so it's my privilege to welcome all of you here this evening for another wonderful, provocative evening of discussion about plant biotechnology and science. We have a great panel of guests, and. Jim Davis, who I'll introduce in just a moment, will talk about, give you a little background about who our guests are this evening. Um, first, I wanted to tell you that um, in case you miss anything tonight that you go, oh, I wish I could remember that, you can turn on HEC TV on Sunday evening at five o'clock and you can see the programs that are presented as a conversation series on HEC TV. And let me give you the channels. So that's five o'clock. So if you're a charter cable customer, that's channel 26. And if you are live in the St. Louis city, that would be channel 99 for AT&T universe, universe customers. So um, in addition to tonight's presentation on HEC TV, all of the conversation series are presented on HEC TV and they're always five o'clock on Sunday evenings. So be sure to, uh, to tune in. Um, as far as questions and answers, there were cards as you entered the auditorium and we hope that if you picked one up, you'll write your question on that and there will be people circulating who will collect those questions. If we have time um, after the questions that are handed in, we will be able to take questions from the audience and raise your hand so that someone with a microphone can find you so that when you ask your question, we will be able to hear what that is. Um, I wanted to also thank all of you who are members of the Friends of the Danforth Plant Science Center for your support. And if you're not a member of the Friends, I would encourage you to join. You can join for $100, and it's a fabulous organization, as you all know, or you wouldn't be here this evening. And we encourage everyone to become a supporter of the Danforth Plant Science Center. Um, I do want to make one announcement, and that is that many of you are familiar that we sponsored last um, October, the first World Food Day, where we packaged almost 300, and, or I guess more than 355,000 meals for the community of Tonga in Tanzania. And that was involved over 1,900 volunteers over a two-day period. We're going to do this again, and we actually intend to exceed our uh, last year uh, success of 355 100,000 meals. Um, I think we're going for 500,000 meals this year. So mark your calendars for October 14th and 15th. Um, and before I turn this over to Jim Davis, I just want to put in one little reminder. If you've got a cell phone on, please turn it off. Um, and now I would like to introduce Jim Davis, who is our moderator for this evening. Thank you very much. Biotechnology Industry Organization, which is an advocacy group. Uh, I'm a political scientist, and I might have called it a lobbying group. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, BIO uh, represents over 1,200 uh, organizations involved with biotechnology. Uh, companies, startups, big companies, universities, think tanks, uh, probably some not-for-profits, and others with an interest in biotechnology. Uh, in his former life, he, uh, Jim was a politician uh, with a lengthy political career. Most recently, from 1993 to, I think, 2005, uh, he was in the U.S. House of Representatives representing a district uh, from Pennsylvania. 
Uh, with his background, he brings a knowledge of both the politics and policy of biotechnology. Uh, and in the house, he had a reputation for expertise in health uh, and the environment. I'm delighted that he's with us this evening. On my far right, uh, sitting right next to Jim, is Jay Vroom, uh, who is the president and CEO of Crop Life America. Uh, he's been in that position since 1989. It also is an advocacy group in Washington uh, working uh, to, uh, on, focused on public policy, regulation, litigation, advocacy uh, around the issues related to uh, what, he, what, what the invitation calls crop protection tools, uh, but what we might think of as uh, a variety of chemical means uh, that f people in agriculture use to protect their crops. Uh, I'm delighted that both Jay and Jim are here, and I think we will have a stimulating conversation about many of the problems affecting uh, biotechnology. Uh, some of the format was explained to you previously, but I will add just a, a 30 seconds. Uh, in the past and tonight, we begin the program with 15 minutes or so of back and forth up here, uh, sort of to warm up the audience. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we begin to take questions from you. My job will be simply to try to organize questions as they come in, uh, maybe combine them if they work in the same field, uh, and then read the question. Uh, and if there's time, there'll be uh, questions from the floor uh, into the microphone. But we'll start with the written questions. Um, so I hope, uh, hope we get a number. Uh, and with that out of the way, let me ask the first question. Uh, you're both in advocacy organizations in Washington dealing with biotech. Do your organizations or do you two interact, mutually support, or go your separate ways uh, in dealing with the legislature, dealing with regulatory agencies, and so on. Uh, how do you get together in Washington as allies or as neutral parties? Oh, I would say we're partners. Uh, you know, we represent uh, virtually all the same companies in, in the agriculture space. Uh, Bio has a much larger additional remit, uh, but that also is you know, very simpatico with the agricultural interests that we both uh, share. So, uh, but it takes more than just the two of us. There's a, a village, if you will, of agricultural interests uh, that come together in Washington, D.C. To, to work for good public policy. We do work together. We are partners. Um, I would, well, let, me, let me begin by actually thanking Danforth Center for inviting us here this evening and thank all of you for coming. And thank all of you for supporting this the, the center, um, which really has its on its as its focus figuring out how to feed the next uh, three billion hungry people who are due to arrive on the planet in the next few decades uh, with dwindling amount of agriculture. So what what Jay and I do, uh, as well as the work of this center, is to try to figure out how we can feed those those folks um, who uh, on 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 what is a, 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 a dwindling amount of, of land that we can use for agriculture. Um, one of the ways that um, that the companies that are that are represented in bio uh, are special is that they use biotechnology as a mechanism to do that, and so you have uh, plants that have uh, that are um, bred to have traits that, c for instance, can um, resist uh, pests or have traits that can resist herbicides uh, that otherwise um, destroy the the other plants in the environment. You're probably familiar with that. So it's, um, it seems like it should be the Lord's work. It seems like it shouldn't, be, uh, shouldn't require a lot of, uh, of lobbying and arm twisting to try to figure out how to uh, get policymakers to uh, understand all of this. But uh, as I'm sure we'll get into in tonight, there's a fair amount of controversy well. about it. And, um, and so it takes a constant effort to educate uh, not only the, the, um, the, mem the policymakers, and the reason we, we use the word ad advocacy is because we, as opposed to lobbying, we do lobby. Uh, on the Hill and in the state legislatures, but we advocate among within the public at large as well. How would you describe the current climate uh, as it affects biotechnology and development of biotechnology? The current, what do I say, the political climate, the policy climate, the economic climate? Um, and then I understand climate change affects plants too, but that's right, not right. right now the climate I'm talking about. Well, 
Uh, the, the, uh, the political climate is generally, uh, if we talk about agricultural biotechnology, is generally good in the United States. Um, it, uh, uh, Ninety-seven percent of the, of the corn that's grown, grown for, for food and fuel and, uh, in this country is, is uh, BT corn, it's biotech, most of the nearly uh, in the high 90s in the cotton and soy. So it's widely accepted by farmers in this country, very quickly adapted and, um, and uh, uh, prized by the, by the farmers who use it because of the productivity enhancements that it gets. But there is a well-organized group of, po of people who are opposed to it. Um, uh, some of those are in the organic movement. Um, we don't think that there should be a, um, an either-or proposition here. We think that we can coexist very nicely with one another. Uh, but there is also an ilk of people who, who um, I would argue, have a sort of a romantic notion about the fact that we should all live on one-acre farmettes and, and go out in the morning with our bonnets and hose and um, would that it be that way, but um, they, don't, they don't like large-scale farming and they associate uh, biotechnology with it. They don't, for the most part, understand the science. Um, it's like people say they don't want um, any chemicals in their food and they don't want any genes in their food without really fully understanding the now, speaking of chemicals of those statements. Speaking and of chemicals in food, let me yeah. turn to Jay, since uh, a lot of his members deal with chemicals at, and plants. Right. How how's, do you see the climate the same way uh, as Jim does? By and large, uh, you know, the people who have a concern or fear or phobia about technology are going to, you know, sort of not be necessarily focused on any one technology, but in general be skeptical. And, and let's be fair here, uh, over the course of, you know, modern experience and scientific development, going back at least to the 40s and 50s uh, and coming forward, we've made some mistakes with technology uh, in agriculture and many other walks of life. Uh, I think that the one thing that has always grounded the United States uh, in terms of our society and our politics and our regulation is uh, we've got more science basis uh, and scientific fact that is woven into the fabric of the way we regulate technologies uh, than any other place that I'm acquainted with uh, in the world and that's to our benefit but we also have a very robust political system and uh, the opportunity to express ourselves and frankly some of those activist uh, extreme organizations have made a positive difference when they have criticized certain technologies and made those of us who are part of those technology industries more responsive and reactive and, and thoughtful about you know, the safety of our products, uh, how to manage the risks, and also better about articulating the benefits. And I think that's kind of how we got into this misunderstanding and mistrust of the safety of our food supply as a society. Uh, partly it's also because there are some urban elites that have done very well in publishing books and being critical of modern agriculture. But uh, really, it's our fault in agriculture for allowing that void to have occurred. And some of that is because as we become so complex and sophisticated about the technologies that we use in agriculture, whether it's biotechnology or uh, precision uh, machinery that is connected to satellites to be you know, GPS controlled or crop protection products or fertilizers, uh, we've forgotten that we need to explain this to the public and you know, many of us are so specialized that we don't know anything about the other sectors of modern agriculture. Uh, so I would just like to mention that uh, another thing you have here in St. Louis is the largest collection of major farm commodity organization headquarters on the planet uh, led by the soybean and corn industry trade associations that are here. And uh, they've organized with a bunch of other uh, agricultural farm interests to uh, launch something called the U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance. Uh, it's just getting started, but it's dedicated to doing exactly what I just described as a problem, and that is to bring more of us to get together across agriculture to develop messages that everyday people outside of agriculture can understand so that we can be better about telling our story about the benefits of biotechnology, about the benefits of modern animal husbandry, and all those other stories that, you know, just aren't getting out there. 
I asked a minute ago about the climate, and let me switch particularly to the regulatory climate and ask whether it has significantly changed uh, since the election of a Republican House of Representatives. Is the regulatory climate the same, tougher, lighter, more interested, less interested? Well, the, uh, it, it, it's been pretty quick. It's been a sh fairly short amount of time since the, uh, <coughs> the, the Congress took the oath of office in early January. So, uh, and of course, the regulatory side, to be sort of um, precise, is, is done at, at the executive branch of government, which is in the, within the Obama administration. But, it, but it's overseen by congressional it's committees. It's overseen by congressional. So uh, I, I would say a, a very good sign from our point of view has been that, that there is a... Um, a case that was just settled, and it has to do with, with uh, Roundup Ready Alfalfa. Alfalfa that uh, Monsanto uh, had the technology in a company called FGI, uh, developed the seeds using that technology, and it's an alfalfa uh, that can be, uh, be grown, and uh, because it is resistant to glyphosate, the, uh, the herbicide, uh, farmers can plant it, and then they can spray it with, with, that, with that herbicide, and it will kill all the, uh, the weeds. They don't have to till the ground and have the soil run off and all of that. Um, but it, the, the uh, alfalfa is not harmed by that. Um, in, in, in July 14th of 2005, um, the, uh, um, uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture did an environmental assessment, and they said um, that this product did not pose a threat of any kind to the environment. Um, nine months later, a suit was filed by a group of, of environmentalists. Uh, in, in, so it started in, it was approved in July of 05. In February of 07, the court, a court ruled that in fact, um, the US Department of Agriculture should have done not just an environmental s assessment, but a full scale environmental impact statement with USDA had already decided it wasn't necessary. So they did that. It took them two more years, two and a half, almost three more years. They t accepted 244,000 comments. Um, finally, they issued their uh, in full environmental impact statement in uh, 09, so now uh, over five, four years have gone by. And then another year went by for everybody to take a look at that. And this last December, they decided that um, uh, actually there is no adverse effect, no increased weediness, no difference in compositional or nutritional qualities. It's not toxic. It's, uh, the, the herbicide is less environmentally adverse than any other, no effect on human health, no effect on soils, climate, air quality, or water. And, um, and that is an example where the uh, regulatory process, in our view, uh, has been perverted by groups who, uh, who really um, are opposed to the technology as a whole. So we, we think that, and one of the things that we were able to bring to bear with the new Congress is that the the Republican chairman of the Ag Committee held an informal hearing and brought the secretary in to hear a whole group of congressmen, Republicans and Democrats, say, um, you really need to approve this um, and let these farmers get back to what they were, uh, they, they were doing. Um, so we we're very focused on trying to figure out how do, we, how do we be good stewards of the environment, which we want to do? How do we have a regulatory process that does, in fact, look at all of the uh, pertinent environmental questions, but isn't one that can be abused just to slow the process down for the sake of slowing the process down. So to your question, Jim, the, you know, the climate has changed in terms of a lot of rhetoric mm -hmm. since the elections. Uh, some actions have changed. Uh, the Roundup Ready Alfalfa decision that Jim mentioned uh, being one example. Uh, another one uh, following immediately, almost immediately after that, was a decision to approve uh, amylase corn uh, improved by biotechnology that is a plant variety now that uh, will improve uh, corn's performance in ethanol plants. But now uh, that, that action was argued against by a lot of food companies, yes. millers, cornmeal people, right. um, and uh, it's still food safe, but I brought in a description because I thought it was pretty dramatic. Um, <laughs> See if I can. The Millers warned that if the industrial cr corn cross-pollinated or mixed with food, corn used for food, it could lead to crumbly corn chips, soggy cereal, <laughs> loaves of bread with soupy centers, and corn dogs with inadequate coatings. They were really upset. Yeah, this is a, <laughs> this is a real crisis in the and, making, right? So, uh, no, and, but it's a, it, it is a great example of how, you know, there are uh, always going to be some give and take on some of these decisions. 
Uh, however, we know that agriculture and farmers in particular have had experience in managing uh, these kinds of crops uh, to keep them separate. Uh, and, and again, because there's no safety question involved here, it's a matter of quality. Uh, but the opportunity to have an improved corn variety that will enhance farmers' ability to participate in the ethanol market. Uh, some of you, how many of you notice uh, when you fill up your cars whether ethanol is part of the component? That's, that's an environmental benefit, okay? Because it improves the emissions of your car to satisfy other things that society wants to accomplish as we drive our automobiles. And agriculture has been delivering, you know, this environmental solution through ethanol additives to your gasoline. And we need to be better about articulating that that's an environmental benefit that farmers are delivering. And last year, 38% of the corn that farmers grew in the United States of America went into ethanol plants. It's a tremendous increase. It was only 7% of the U.S. corn crop in 2001. Uh, and again, so that, that was accomplished during a period of time when biotechnology was helping uh, farmers improve corn yields. But now with amylase as another tool, we can target and even be better about delivering even more ethanol at probably cheaper prices and be more competitive and have the environmental benefit. All but of that coming straight from the farm, but with good technology. But with, if corn is used increasingly for ethanol, what will that do to the price of corn in foodstuffs? Won't that go up? That's one question. The second question is, if it takes um, um, fuel both to plant the corn and more fuel to distill the ethanol, uh, is it still a bargain with regard to energy? Yes. So uh, another story about ethanol is that not only when you make ethanol do you have that fuel additive, but you have what, what are called distiller dried grains, which are the leftover meal, uh, and that is a very good feed source. So we're still making food out of this process of making ethanol, and the improvement in terms of the gallons of ethanol that are made from a bushel of corn and an acre of corn have been improved massively to the point where it is a very positive BTU up benefit uh, in terms of man's net energy yield, if you will. But would we still be ahead with regard to the food supply? And I'm concerned about the tension between fuel and food yep. because nine, mil nine billion or maybe 12 billion people will have to be fed, but they will also want energy. And you know, right. how do you weigh that? But, but what so I'm it's all about the marketplace, the price of gasoline, the price of oil, and the price of corn. Sure. And, and the advent pour in a little extra technology like this new amylase trait, and all of these incentives keep going. But at the same time, there are other biofuel sources now being developed, uh, some of which will be enabled also by biotechnology. Algae, for other, example, other which is being done Algae, here. other cellulosic sources. So there are great opportunities. And again, if you let the market uh, have an opportunity to provide incentives, other things will come forward. So if you look, look to the future of how to resolve this food versus fuel yeah. um, controversy, um, you do look to the cellulosic applications. And so I'm not a scientist, so um, uh, for those of you who are, excuse this. But um, you know, if the, the kernel of corn evolved for a certain purpose that has to do with re reproduction germination, obviously, and so it was advantageous for it to be very soluble. The stalk and the cobs and the leaves of the corn evolved to be very rigid and structural, and as a result of that, they don't break down so easily. Now, they all contain um, sugars that can be uh, distilled into fuels, um, but it's very difficult to, to break down the cellulose in the stalks and the, and the cobs and the, and, and the leaves. What biotechnology has been able to do is, is been able to take the, ge take the genetics of certain, um, and make certain, using genetics, what the scientists did is say, well, who, who's good at breaking down uh, this tough cellulose stuff? And somebody said, well, termites are pretty good at it, um, woefully for some of us. And, um, and, and you look at the fung fungi in, in the woods that are growing on the, and tearing apart the, the trunks of trees and so forth. And looking into those genetics, are able to use the, the, the information within those genetics to make enzymes that can break down the cellulose and turn into sugar to distill into fuel. And so 
that's, um, those are the, among the next, next phases in many of the ethanol plants that are, um, that as we move into the ability to do that, I think we, we eventually will be moving towards the cellulose, and it's not only in corn byproducts, but in wood chips and a whole variety of switchgrass sure. and so forth. If I, if I can add an editorial comment here, that sure. um, sort of to look at this from the 50,000 foot level from a biotechnology point of view, um, all of the information you know, on the planet Earth is in DNA. So e every aspect of how, the, the ev of, of what makes plants function, and take up nutrients and grow, and what creates their ability to be structural, every aspect of, of, of animal life, every aspect of air life is completely uh, generated by information within our DNA. And we're at a point in our history um, where we're beginning to understand those genetics and the, and the, the, the DNA at a very, very profound level. And now we have the ability to use that information, for instance, to say, well, if someone has a, inherits a, a genetic mutation that causes a terrible disease, can we use what we understand about genetics to treat that disease? Can we use what we know about genetics to create new uh, and advanced foods and new and advanced fuels and solve a lot of human problems that have been causing tremendous human suffering for all of our existence? Some people view that as Adam and Eve and the, tree, the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Some people view that as Pandora's box and a variety of other, there have been myths throughout our history about what happens when man gets into, into certain uh, realms of, of knowledge. Um, I would argue that it is the nature of human beings um, to not shy away from that, but to figure out how to use uh, that knowledge and to use it wisely, knowing that there will always be the potential of intentional misuse and, and unintended consequences. But, uh, but I think that the potential for us to use this, this knowledge uh, to, as we in bio talk about healing and fueling and feeding the world, is so spectacular. And it may be the only way that we will be able to heal and to fuel and to feed the world, that we have no choice but to, to uh, move ahead in a, in a bold and pioneering way and just be safe and smart about how we do it. Jim, you mentioned sure. algae uh, as a potential component of sure. the biofuels uh, business. A lot of research going on in that area. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, I never think about this. Uh, you see algae on a pond or in a stream and you think that's a weed, but in this case, we're talking about trying to cultivate it to make biomass to create uh, ethanol fuel. Uh, but other weeds can then come along and compete with the algae. And so someone has patented the Roundup Ready gene to protect algae and use Roundup to protect uh, that algae crop if in fact that becomes commercially viable. So uh, all of these ideas and technologies, uh, you know, have miraculous beginnings, but sometimes some of them get reinvented and reapplied in other miraculous ways. Does our current agricultural policy favor corn-based ethanol? I would say it does. Uh, more than our agricultural policy, our energy policy does. Okay. Uh, and, and yet, uh, I don't know that there's any particular use of the word corn in that energy policy. It's all about ethanol as a bio-based fuel. And so, mm -hmm. it, it will be flexible for sources of ethanol coming from other biomass uh, mm -hmm. alternatives. And remember, uh, you know, of course, that the, the I, part of the, the goal is to use less petroleum uh, for that has a lot to do with, with war and peace in the Middle East and elsewhere and places like Venezuela where we don't have a lot of friends um, and, uh, and, and the global warming issues and so there's, there's, a, there's a, a whole host of reasons why we really do need to move to a sustainable um, bio-based fuel um, pathway in this country. To do that, say over the next five years, uh, what's on, and this is for each of you, what's on your to-do list uh, for your organization or for you as the CEO? Um, uh, in some order of priority maybe, what ought to happen this year, next year, in the future to get where you think we ought to be with regard both to food and fuel? Well, on the, uh, if I may, on the, on the um, fuel side, what, what we know is that, I'll, I'll, let me just talk about cellulosic ethanol uh, coming from, from uh, corn stalks and wood chips and, and cellula cellulose from switchgrass and so forth. The, um, we, we're at the advent of this technology. And so we don't have full scale plants operating right now. We're trying to perfect the enzymes uh, so that we can do this using 
as little in, uh, energy inputs as possible so you don't have to heat the material up so the enzyme can do its, uh, break it down in a, in, in, but using less temperature. Uh, and um, because we were at the advent, uh, there aren't a lot of bankers willing to come in and a lot of investors willing to come in and say, I'm ready to start, throw a lot of money at that. So it's, it, we think it's an appropriate place for the federal government to make investments, uh, matching grants with the private sector in pilot plants to dem demonstration plants. And so that's where we've been advocating, and that's very much on our due list, is to get uh, uh, additional federal funds to, uh, to test out the, the, this technology on a scale that can prove the concept and prove the, the economic viability of it. So then the private sector will say, oh, okay, Uncle Sam has demonstrated that it works. Now we're ready to invest in a big way because it will with, take a large investment. With the deficit now, it's about one and a half trillion, and you said, um, extra funds to, uh, to, to support these startups. Um, in the current economic climate, is, uh, is that likely or just tough? Well, everything's tough in the current economic climate and it's particularly tough in Washington right now. Um, I, th there are decisions that have to be made, um, priority decisions, and, um, and some of them uh, involve shifting funds from very diverse functions into other, uh, other functions. Some of them just need to involve taking a look at what we're doing in the energy side, and of course, that's, w that's um, you know, what, what politics is basically, uh, how you resolve issues without shooting each other, at least for the most part. And so, um, you know, we, we have debates about do you put mon more money into trying to clean coal, or do you put more money into solar, or do you put more money into wind, or do you put more money into cellulosic eth ethanol? And those are very complicated decisions that have to be made by smart people, and Believe it or not, there are a few of them in Washington. <laughs> of course, uh, we're both here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Washington so, is in trouble for the next 24 hours, right? At least. Well, uh, so that's a great question, uh, Jim, and, I, and, and your answer, Jim, is spot on. Uh, I'd add that uh, we're at a point, because of the budget uh, pressures that were on the agriculture committees and USDA, even before uh, the current economic crisis began now three or four years ago to realign the way we spend money on farm programs that that pressure for the 2012 farm bill is going to get extremely magnified and we need to be thinking now about how to sort of realign and reposition uh, for the future and one of the aspects uh, that's been uh, a tremendous miracle, but again, not very well articulated by us in agriculture, is the accomplishment of the American farmer in selling food for export. Um, we exceeded $100 billion worth of agricultural exports uh, last year. Uh, we'll probably exceed $120 billion this year. Uh, not only does that mean, you know, a great market for the American farmer, but it creates lots of other great jobs in our economy. And yet, uh, we have some pending trade agreements that uh, the Congress hasn't ratified, uh, particularly for Colombia, Korea, and Panama, uh, that are going to be great opportunities for continued growth of agricultural exports and opportunities for the American farmer to capitalize on that, not only for his benefit, but his or her benefit. We have a lot of lady farmers in the United States. But also, uh, you know, the longshoremen that load the ships, uh, the workers in uh, soybean plants that process soybeans into meal and oil for export. Many thousands and tens of thousands of great jobs from exports. But we could do more if we had more aggressive uh, activity around prosecuting our agenda for expanding free trade around the planet with our own policy and negotiating additional uh, free trade agreements. Um, so that would be one of my to-do list items right now through the next uh, four or five years. That response is a good lead-in to a question <laughs> I got from two people. Since you mentioned free trade, what's the likelihood that tariffs on ethanol imports from Brazil being lowered? I'll defer to Jim. <laughs> well, <clears throat> here's how it works in Washington. I have no idea. <laughs> 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 
But my executive vice president for food and agriculture is going like this, so I have to tell you that I think it's unlikely that the tariffs will go down. Well, you know, I agree with that, and I don't know anything about the subject, yeah. but I think it's unlikely too. So, so the, the, the government uh, supports ethanol uh, by way of uh, waiving a certain amount of the federal excise tax that you otherwise would pay on that gallon of ethanol when you buy a gallon of gasoline that's 10% or whatever of your total gallon. And that's worth, a, today, I think the waiver is about 45 cents a gallon on the ethanol component. They also have about a 50 cent a gallon tariff on imported ethanol. And so the combination of those two create an advantage for domestically produced ethanol serving the U.S. marketplace. Uh, the the, sub the uh, excise tax uh, waiver has used to be over 50 cents. It's now under 50 cents. That was partly a compromise that got affected between Republicans and Democrats in the Congress uh, a year ago. And uh, so there's give and take. Uh, the, the import tariff really reflects a lot of other trade dynamics and the fact that much of the ethanol that's made in Brazil that's referenced in your question, almost all of it's made from sugar cane. And sugar cane is a crop that gets a whole host of other kinds of subsidies, particularly from the government of Brazil. So uh, it'll be a complex question that will be tested and pushed around, but my guess is it will stand longer than the other components in terms of our policy. But there, there is maybe... He got that right, by the way. Maybe, <laughs> maybe there is a bit of inconsistency between importing as much oil as we do, but putting a tariff on imported ethanol. Washington is a yes, I know. marvelous place of uh, contradictory thoughts and policies. <laughs> and what did, uh, wasn't it Emerson who said, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little mind. <laughs> uh, uh, let me uh, shift ground here. Um, we've talked about being better about telling our story when it comes to the benefits of biotechnology. What can we do as ordinary citizens to help? Now, I don't understand the question because there's not a single ordinary citizen in this room. Uh, <laughs> you all friends of the Plant Science Center. But be that as it may, the question is, what can we do to help? Well, <clears throat> I, I, I think if you, it goes back in my mind to the point that I made earlier about sort of this notion that we are now in what I think is the biotechnology century and we're at a point where we have this incredible capacity to, to manipulate genes and, and, um, and, and accomplish tremendous things. Um, when, when, I, um, when, I, when I was uh, screening for this job, I was in Congress and I was, I was thinking about applying for this job and I went and I went to the search committee. Um, the, the search committee said to me, um, we have a question for you, and that is, do you have passion for biotechnology? And I said, I was thinking about this question at 3 o'clock in the morning, and here's the answer I came up with, which was, I said, if you go back to the beginning of life on this planet, when the, in the primordial soup, when there was no life forms, and, and we had the first self-replicating cell, uh, and, and since then, in the four billion years that has elapsed since that time, uh, through Darwinian um, uh, processes, We've evolved to this, to who we are. And at least we think of ourselves as the crown of creation. The roaches probably think they are. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but we have this capacity to literally reach into our body, pull out our DNA, put it under a microscope. And from what we learn, we prevent a child, from, we prevent parents from burying their child. And we prevent uh, a man to, from waking up one morning and turning to his wife of 65 years and asking, who are you? And, and that's an extraordinary thing for us to be able to use um, uh, genetics and our knowledge about DNA to prevent things awful as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and, and cancers and, and diabetes and so forth. And, um, and yet there are those who say we shouldn't be messing around with genes. You know, that's, that's the purview of God and we're playing with the building blocks of life and we shouldn't be there. And, it, you know, it's, when I was a kid we used to say, my uncle used to say, would you like some sodium chloride on your eggs? And I'd say, I don't want any sodium chloride on my eggs. And he'd say, that's salt, stupid. And, and it sort of illustrates the point that when, you, when people don't know very much about chemicals, anything that sounds like it's a chemical sounds like it's a bad thing. 
Um, and so I think just sort of as ordinary people, when you're talking to folks, and if you hear them say, well, I'm not so sure about this, this uh, biotechnology thing, it sounds awfully scary, I think just reminding people that, um, that there's nothing new about, there's nothing terribly new about the idea that we manipulate genes. I mean, you can go into a whole food store and people think now I'm, I'm in, in, in where everything is natural. And I, it, you'd be hard pressed to find something that, that hasn't been dramatically changed in its genetics by mankind. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe some walnuts in a bag or something, but, you know, certainly not the produce, and certainly not the, the, the meat and, and dairy and so forth. So manipulating genes uh, for good results has been um, going on for a long time. We're just able to do it in a much more sophisticated way. And I think we have to become sophisticated about understanding that. So. Uh, You've got a whole host of other questions we need to get to, but I'll just say, you know, a, a few numbers. Uh, seven billion people, almost seven billion on the planet right now. Uh, 900 million of us, including the 200 of us. Uh, seven, uh, 200 of us are in the seven billion. 900 million of us not here in the room uh, are going to go to bed hungry tonight. And 20, 30,000 or more tomorrow will die because of hunger-related disease. But most of them children. Most of them children, and, but very few of them here in the United States. But 43 million, that's the number of our fellow citizens that are on food stamps. So there is a hunger problem in this country. But most of us, 340 million of us, spend all of our time really thinking about, gee, I need to lose weight, I need to exercise more. And it's really hard to relate to there is a, few, a true food shortage and crisis right now today, and the world population is going to continue to grow and grow and grow, including here in the United States. We've got a demand to meet today, but an unbelievable demand. Half again, as much food we need to produce per year in the next 10 or 15 years just to keep up, much less to address those who are going to die tomorrow because of starvation. I've been reading the number 9 billion, but I saw something in The Economist that came this week that talked about, I think, in 30 years, the population of the world being 12 billion. And that will be an extraordinary number to feed. 3 feed. billion of them are going to be dead. Oh, this was counting 12 yeah. billion live people. Oh, okay. Okay. You have a there sense of humor. Very dark humor. Um, <laughs> But now, we're talking about gene, uh, manipulating genes, changing the genetic structure of plants. Uh, this question, how do we control the cross-pollinization of the high-tech seeds with other crops? Well, there's a partly tremendous that amount of science uh, out there that uh, got started long before uh, our ability to apply uh, recombinant DNA uh, kinds of technologies using modern gene guns and the rest. Um, Plant breeders have been working at this for, you know, way over 100 years, uh, and that cumulative knowledge uh, adds to the ability of then modern plant breeders to manage gene flow. So it's not something we just started in the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of knowledge uh, passed down and, and being built upon every day. So, so, I mean, here's the thing is, the thing is you can't 100%. Uh, and so we have to be honest about that. The fact of the matter is that if you have BT corn, BT for those of you, I probably in this part of the world, everybody knows what this is, but um, Bacillus thuringiensis is a bacterium that um, uh, the organic farmers figured out that when you spray this bacterium on, the, on your plants, the certain insects like the corn borer, when they consume, when they bite the plant and that bacteria is in it, there's a protein that that bacteria makes that causes the gut of the, of the, of the worm to perforate and it dies. And what uh, uh, companies like Monsanto did is figure out exactly what the genetic sequence in that, in that bacterium is that, that produces that protein. They insert it into the genomic gene genome, the genetic sequence of corn, and then now when the, when the worm bites the root of the corn, um, that protein's already in the corn and the, and the worm dies. And um, it, we've been using it for decades now, and it, it um, there's no, no uh, um, environmental issues concerned with it, no human health concerns, no animal health concerns, no environmental concerns whatsoever. But um, given the fact that pollen blows, um, there is very, very tiny, tiny uh, percentage of pollen that actually if someone you know, 
down the road as, as it is growing orga organic corn, um, that that pollen could enter into the, that uh, germ there. And so you have what's called low-level presence of, of, um, of the genetically altered um, uh, pollen. Um, so the, what's important is to understand it. If, the, if that, in fact, if, if, if having 100% Bt coin poses no health issues, then having some tiny, tiny, infinitesimal, small, low presence uh, in, uh, in an organic product, for instance, causes no issue. But what's happened is that many in the organic movement has ma have made that sort of a, a, a line that they want to draw. Not because it has anything to do with what organics is really about. In fact, the organic farming standards don't, don't disqualify you from being considered organic if you have this low-level presence. But now they've sort of been hoisted by their own petard because they've said, well, we don't want to have any of this GMO stuff there. Well, um, uh, they're going to have to understand that, 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 that that we can't have zero tolerance if we want to have the kind of productivity that's going to be necessary to feed 12 billion people. And uh, unless and until someone finds some sort of actual scientific basis for not doing it, um, which is unlikely, um, that's, that's going to be the reality. There's nothing wrong with it. A very different question, but I think it's a very good one. How would you assess or grade the level of knowledge, understanding, or expertise of those in our government who must ultimately make policy decisions regarding biotechnology. <laughs> without, without a scientific background, how do they learn what is vital in making informed decisions? Can they really get up to speed in this regard? And Jim, you're a perfect person because you've been in politics. You were one of those, and you've already confessed to not being a scientist. Right, right. You um, could fool me. So, <laughs> uh, well, I've been in politics. I've been used to fooling people for a very long time. <laughs> um, the, the, um, the fact of the matter is that when you are a, an elected official, whether a state legislator, a governor, or a member of Congress, you, uh, uh, it is uh, an extraordinarily difficult job because you are expected to be knowledgeable on, th on thousands of issues. And you go to a town meeting like this, and, and we're talking about a subject matter that's wide enough, but it's only this wide now. If I'm a member of Congress and you're firing questions about me about defense and you're qu firing questions about education and energy and, 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 and Middle East and foreign policy and all that, I'm supposed to sound like I know what I'm talking, it's pretty hard. And so, um, uh, you know, that you, they tend to know, members of Congress know a lot about everything and, and not a whole lot about any specific thing. Uh, they tend to specialize based on their committee assignments and so forth. But it is a function of people like Jay and I to try to explain that. So now, um, it, it, in the beginning you say, well, you know, you say advocacy group, but it's really lobbying. People have to understand that lobbying is, is there's nothing bad about lobbying. It's essential. Yeah. It's the way and you so, learn. Right. And so we, uh, I, I'm thankful every day that both for the 24 years I was in elected office, the people who came into my office who actually knew what they were talking about, and could sit across me at a table and say, let me explain to you how corn works. Let me explain to you how plumbing works. Let me explain to you how elementary education works. Um, and the, the professional lobbyists know that they better be very, very accurate with their information because if they, if they give a, a member of Congress bad information and then the congressman acts on that, that person's never coming back into the office again. So we spend a lot of our time on the Hill um, explaining all of this to, to members of Congress and um, uh, and it's actually a beautiful thing about our country that we have the opportunity to do that because there are plenty of places where decisions are made by people who, who not only don't know what they're talking about, but don't even allow you to, the people who do know what they're talking about to give them any input. So we hear a lot of politicians and the media talk about nameless, faceless bureaucrats in Washington, and there is a lot of that, uh, and we encounter a lot of that in our day jobs. But the truth is that Certainly in agriculture, at U.S. Department of Agriculture, at FDA, USDA, EPA, there are some world-class scientists, career staff that are hardworking, knowledgeable bureaucrats, and they span the comings and goings of politicians, and, and they're the experts that help provide that continuity. Uh, Sharon uh, was in that role uh, in government. Uh, uh, as one of those scientific experts uh, before you joined bio. Uh, so there are, there are a phenomenal array of great experts that work in government uh, and, and don't 
get the thanks and credit that they deserve to help support this process. I think that's crucially important, and I'm delighted you made that point, because there are a lot of able, smart, energetic public servants. Yes. You use the word bureaucrat, and it has the same unfortunate connotation that lobbyist does. Right. You get a sense of Congress, is, you, the country, the, Washington, is full of bureaucrats and lobbyists, and you sort of hold your head. Uh, but in fact, we couldn't get along without those public servants, and Congress couldn't get along without those advocates. You know, it's interesting. Um, some members of Congress vote the wrong way because they just don't know any better. Sometimes members of Congress vote the wrong way. They know better, but they don't think that you know better. And um, you know, I always thought that was, people always asked me when I was in Congress, are you, sp are you supposed to do what you think is right or what you think your constituents want you to do? And I always said, well, I'm supposed to do what I think they would want me to do if they knew what I knew. Um, <laughs> and uh, you just get you out of any problem. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, but you know, we, that, that's our responsibility as citizens, to be mature enough so that you, your Congress, can, Congress can make hard decisions um, and not be afraid that, the, that people are just going to, that people have less information than the Congress does, if that's possible, could actually, you know, sort of steamroll them and, and yell at them and, and intimidate them from actually doing this right. You look at it, we're talking before the program started about the, the national deficit. Um, everybody, an awful lot of people in Washington know that we're not going to get out of this unless we do some really difficult things like raise the retirement age for Social Security, you know, means test Medicare, um, probably do away with the home mortgage interest deduction, you know, these uh, parade of horribles. Um, they can sit down with the, with the economists and look and see that's what we have to do. No, there's no way out of it, but they're afraid that you will hang them and throw them out of office if they do it. So we have a responsibility to be s as smart as we expect our representatives to One be. quick aside on Social Security that caught my attention. When the retirement age was set at 65, life expectancy in this country was about 64. Life expectancy now is about 80. Right. Go figure. But now, w I've been talking about how to get Congress up to speed on biotechnology and technical topics. This shifts it down uh, several notches. You talked about more transparency in the agricultural market. Your agencies, created, your agencies created any program through the education system to educate youth about the importance of biotechnology. Are you getting the word out through social networks like Facebook? Are you going sort of out to us, the ordinary citizens, uh, with your advocacy? Well, we are, and again, that's not- And you're here tonight. Just uh, our organizations, uh, but the opportunity to talk to audiences like you all and encourage you to talk to your friends and neighbors and you know, mention that you know, we do have these kinds of conversations, uh, that our industry is open to criticism. Uh, that's one of the things that I think oftentimes gets us into a political corner is this suggestion or appearance that perhaps we want to give no comment as the answer to a tough question around a tough situation. But we're not, and, and it's up to us to have to step out and, and take those tough questions and uh, use the social media venues because that's where a lot of this debate is going on. We, I try to get out and speak to young people as much as I can, and the younger the better, which is obviously why I'm here this evening. But um, <laughs> we, actually, we actually create, we created a, a, a thing called the Biotechnology Institute. And the Biotechnology Institute uh, exists for the purpose of trying to stimulate young people in the middle school and, and, and high school levels to get involved in science, and specifically to get involved in biotechnology. We do a, a thing called the Biogenius, um, which is G, has a G-E-N-E -E in it. Um, award where we, we have competitions in high schools and then we bring them all out to our an annual convention, a whole bunch of them, and give them awards. Um, we have a program called Scientists in the Classroom. In fact, I was just out at Monsanto uh, today and um, interesting, um, trying to interest and I think successfully interesting and get the uh, ag industry to um, support scientists in the classroom uh, in, in a variety of places. So there's a lot to, to do there. We do have websites. Um, we have um, uh, we're using social media. Uh, what are they? Uh, hmm? No, no, I mean our websites are by I am biotech.com and and why biotech.com and so um, yeah, we, we're, we're doing our best in that regard. I've been told we have one more question, so 
This is a broad one about a topic we haven't gotten much into except we talked about Brazil and sugarcane. How is biotechnology impacting Africa, Europe, Latin America, and the Middle East? 25, uh, 25 words or less. Yes. <laughs> Very well. <laughs> um, in, in, in Europe, there has long been a resistant to, um, resistance to biotechnology agriculture. Um, there are a variety, there is a variety of reasons for that. One of them is that um, uh, they had the whole mad cow thing there, and so there was a general distrust of agricultural, particularly agricultural um, uh, regulatory agencies. Uh, there is a level of protectionism uh, there where they just didn't want to compete with American uh, exporters. Um, and, uh, and, they, and the Green parties are much stronger there, and so uh, they, they, they tend to operate on a precautionary principle in Europe, which is not, not that something is uh, innocent, as technology is innocent until proven guilty, but it's guilty until proven innocent, which you can't always do. So we've had some struggles, and we've had to fight those struggles out in world trade organizations to, to get the Europeans to accept um, our products. Um, there is, um, the m most of the individual farmers who use biotechnology are, um, are, are in the developing world. I mean, obviously we have huge farms here, but we have lots and lots of small farmers around the world who are, who are using them because they know this, how much they, they lose their, of their crops from pests, for instance, and so they're interested in expanding their um, productivity. Um, certainly, uh, China uh, and India are uh, taking it up very well. Um, so is most of Latin America, um, but it's really um, uh, not enough in Africa yet, and, and part of that, frankly, is because a lot of the Europeans have a way of dissuading the Africans from, um, from uh, using these technologies. Yeah. Jay? So I, I would agree. Uh, one of our member companies is, uh, has Swiss uh, headquarters. Um, when they decided to expand and, and actually develop uh, a new biotechnology research center for agriculture, uh, the Swiss environment was such that they decided to build that plant of, uh, research center uh, across the border in France. Uh, and within the last two years, they moved all those operations to North Carolina. Uh, just to show you the kind of governmental resistance to the acceptance of biotechnology for agriculture that still exists in Europe, even though all the while uh, we both hear from European government leaders uh, asking us how can we un undo the problems that we've created in terms of public perception because they now see that European farmers are falling way behind sure. in terms of productivity because of the lack of access to all of this technology. Uh, I, my wife Jamie and I had the opportunity to spend some time on a development project in Africa uh, this past August and uh, in Malawi saw some of the great work that Monsanto is doing in introducing hybrid corn technology and uh, how rapidly adapted and adopted uh, those opportunities are in terms of using that technology but not biotechnology improved corn because most of these African nations, as Jim just said, are fearful of the fact that their opportunity to export some fruits and vegetables off-season into Europe could be threatened because of those trade uh, concerns that Europe keeps extrapolating and pushing out against other suppliers. So it is a concern, uh, but when you look at what's happening finally in Africa, thanks in large part to the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa that supported in large part by the Rockefeller and Gates Foundation, uh, I think we see uh, some hope in helping move subsistence farmers up to a more stable productivity and maybe in the decades ahead, uh, modern agriculture really getting into place in those kinds of agricultural environments. But uh, again, it's an opportunity for all of you to be advocates for your friends and neighbors to tell this story because you have the credibility uh, as being interested parties, friends and neighbors, family members to tell about the miracle of modern agriculture. So one quick addition, if I could. That one of the things that I'm hopeful might change in Europe, the Europeans, because they have such an environmental sensitivities, are very, very uh, concerned about uh, global warming, much so than, than we uh, citizens are in the United States. And as, it, as we get to the point, and I'm convinced that we will, where we're more and more using biomass and biofuels, plant-based fuels for energy, 
one of the things that will have to happen is that we'll have to consistently um, genetically um, uh, enhance those plants so that they grow more densely and produce more fuel and so that Europeans may find themselves in a bit of a conundrum where they say, well, if we really want to be responsible in terms of reducing our use of uh, fossil fuels and we really want to use biofuels and now the scientists tell us we, you know, we need to genetically enhance those, those plants in order to get the maximum potential out of that, they may realize, oh, well, maybe it's not such a bad idea. Well, they may import ethanol from Brazil. They may. <laughs> Thank you both very much. This has been a splendid conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to thank you again our panelists, uh, Jim Greenwood and Jay Broom, for doing a terrific job and helping us to understand how complicated all of these things are. Thank you all very much. And, um, Thanks to Jim Davis for, as usual, doing a terrific job of getting the conversation going. And uh, Jim knows more about more things than any of us could ever learn, I think. <laughs> and finally, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Boeing for uh, sponsoring these uh, conversation series. It's been a, a wonderful contribution to us and I think to St. Louis. Thank you all so much. <laughs>